Well, a warm welcome to today's talk. It's Wednesday, the 1st of September. Now, yesterday, we basically looked at the thinking from scientists in the UK who believe that now this virus is going to be endemic, um, at least for a period of time, for several seasons, and that everyone's going to be exposed to it sooner or later. So the question in my mind now, personally, <laughs> just thinking about this entirely personally, is would I want, given that I'm going to be exposed to the virus, would I like to have a third dose of vaccine before I get exposed to the virus? Or do I want to go for sort of the natural immune boost that being exposed to the virus would give me? Because we know that if I'm exposed to the natural immune boost that the natural infection will give me, I'll produce a wider range of antibodies and a wider range of memory B and T cells. This so-called polyclonal response as my immune system responds to different parts of the virus, as well as just the, uh, the spike protein that the vaccines are currently reacting to. Now, as always, uh, we've been looking to Israel for this because they were ahead in their vaccination program. So here we have a report. Um, this is the data we've got to go on at the moment. It's not a lot, to be quite honest. But this is basically an Israeli government report. Um, but I have read it. Uh, it read, re reads like a scientific paper. It's written by all the, all the sort of main brains in the field. And it just reads like a scientific paper. It hasn't been externally peer-reviewed, but I think we can assume that it's been well-reviewed within the uh, Israeli authorities so far. So that's the data we've got. And to, to give you the bottom line on this video, um, I think the answer is yes, I probably would prefer a booster dose before I get naturally infected. Even although my protection against hospitalisation and severe disease is already high by virtue of the two doses I've already had. But let, let's look at the, um, the science behind this. So um, th that's the paper there, booster dose of Pfizer vaccine, basically. Now, interestingly, this is the same original Pfizer vaccine. So this is a bit disappointing, to be quite honest. The pharmaceutical people had promised us months ago that it would be a simple matter to tweak the vaccine to make a specific vaccine against alpha variant or one that's more specific against delta variant. That has not happened so far. Now, why they've gone quiet on that, I don't really know, because we were assured this would be a re relatively straightforward job to do, but it doesn't seem to have happened. And the vaccines that we're being using as, the, as this potential booster dose are the same orig original vaccines that we've, we've had uh, all the way through. So um, not as specific as you might like, but the data's interesting. So background to this is the 30th of July, and of course it's only had it's only the 1st of September now, but 30th of July 2021, third booster dose started to be given of the Pfizer vaccine to uh, people in Israel uh, over the age of 60 years of old, who, who 60 years of age, who had already been fully vaccinated at least five months previously. And some people have been vaccinated quite a lot longer than that before because of this concept of the, the waning immunity. So the Israeli government decided to go for the booster dose option. Um, but that's good because it means we can benefit from the data they collect. Uh, we estimate the reduction in relative risk for confirmed infection of severe COVID, uh, of, of risk for confirmed infection. So the checking, does a third dose reduce confirmed infection and does it reduce severity of COVID-19 is what this study is about. And it's what you call a person day at risk study. So um, we'll see what that means. Uh, that will become obvious what that means as we as we go through this. It's not, it's not too complicated, thankfully, so fairly short uh, study, really. A fairly short presentation to explain this. Now, they had what they called dynamic cohorts. So obviously in research, ideally what you want always is to compare one group of people who had a treatment with another group of people who didn't have a treatment, an experimental group and a control group, so we can make comparisons between the two. But what they were doing here is that people were not booster dosed the, the people didn't have a third dose and then as they went through the study they did have a booster dose and then after 12 days after the booster dose they were considered to be booster dosed so what you really have here is is, is kind of a bit like a test retest situation you you're testing people before they've been 
boost the dose and seeing what their incidence of uh, infection, severe disease and hospitalisation is. And then you're taking those same people after they've had the booster dose, waiting 12 days for the booster to kick in and then analysing those same people again in terms of days life uh, lived in a risky environment, which of course we're all in a risky environment. Uh, so they had the, the, they were comparing one cohort against another cohort, but there were the same people in both cohorts. So it's called dynamic cohorts as person people move from the unvaccinated or the unboosted cohort into the boosted cohort. So quite quite clever really, quite quite a neat experimental technique. So dynamic cohorts move from non-booster to join the booster cohort 12 days after they were vaccinated and they did have pretty good reasons for going with the 12 days that did seem to make uh, quite a bit of sense really. So the no booster cohort they ended up with 4 million person days. So um, given that it's a relatively short period of time, uh, it's only, what, 30th of, so it's 20, 20, 23 days, isn't it? 30, 30th of July to the 22nd of August. So they accumulated, so obviously over a million people in the study, that they accumulated, uh, or a million people eligible, they recruited, recorded 4 million person days before the booster. And in that 40 million person days... 3,473 confirmed infections, 330 cases of severe COVID-19. But then 12 days after the second dose, no, 12 days after the third dose, sorry, 12 days after the booster dose, let's get it right, 12 days after the third booster dose, dose they joined the booster or the boosted cohort. And they recorded 3.4 million person days in that, so not a lot of difference. Um and there was 313 confirmed infections in that, down from the 3,473, and 32 cases of severe COVID-19. And of course, in the statistics, they accounted for the difference between the 4 million and the, uh, the 3 million. So what that means is we have a cohort that was non-boosted. We have a cohort that was boosted. And the statisticians were able to do high quality comparative analysis between those two groups. Now, they did account for, in, before they did the results, they accounted for the fact that some people had been boosted a longer time ago. They accounted for the fact that people at increased age were at greater risk. They accounted for people with comorbidities being at greater risk. So they did factor in a lot of extra things into their calculations that clever statisticians do and the rest of us, at least me, don't fully understand. I can make sense of the results when I read them, but I don't always understand the full statistical process. But these people, they, they, they are well checked. The, statis, the, sti, the statistical techniques are well attested. I, I, the most of the statistics I've done, actually, it was on, um, you can you, well, you can do a lot of statistics just on an ordinary spreadsheet on Excel or something. Then there's lots of other packages I used um, when I was doing research. I did my uh, SPSS statistical package for the social sciences. And it, oh, I wasn't doing particularly social sciences, but you can do any statistical analysis on it. And it'll do every statistical analysis you've ever heard of and, and 100 that I've never heard of. So or 100 that mo unless only people like specialised statisticians have heard of. So um, the, the statistics aren't really a weak point that they're, they're well attested to. So the results, uh, 12 days or more after the booster dose, we found, this is what they found. Now, 9.6 to 13.4 fold decrease in the relative risk of confirmed infection. So these patients were at least 10 times less likely, basically, to get infected. Now, why such a wide range? Well, 9.6 was the protective fold, uh, 9.6 fold decreased protection against infection with one statistical method, 11.4 with another, and 13.4 with another. Now, this is not to question the statistical methods. It's just that you can interrogate this data in different ways. So basically, we're saying that these people were about 10 times or more less likely to be infected, which is great. Um, now, uh, in terms of severe disease, again, depending on the statistical tests and models used, uh, there was a 9.5 fold decrease in the relative risk of severe infection to a 15.5 fold. So one statistical method said a 9.5 fold protection, basically, again, 10 times less likely to get severe disease, severe illness, up to 
times less likely. Now, reading this paper, I thought that given there's been, you see, we know that people, are, if they're going to get sick, there's often a delay. It's at least a week or sometimes two weeks or even longer after the initial infection. So I think the data here on protection against infection is probably accurate. Um, in fact, it is accurate. Uh, the data against severe disease, we probably need another week or two to find out if people develop more severe disease. So given that this is in a relatively small time frame, because remember this was only from um, 30th of July to the 22nd of August, you know, were people getting ill towards the end of August or indeed we, will people get ill um, now in, into September? So um, pretty confident for the accuracy of that. That... I would say confident, but not as highly confident of the accuracy of this compared to this. We need a bit more time, but we can only say what the research has found so far. And this is what it's found so far. We can only go with the data we have. So a few points from here. If, if, as, if, if as we looked at yesterday, um, and it appears to be the case from what the experts in the UK are saying, that the protection against infection can wane by 50%, after six, seven, eight months. Let's assume that is true. Not, protection against hospitalisation remains higher as we've looked at in, in several studies, of course. But if waning immunity to Delta is 50% protection against infection at say six months after vaccination. So instead of someone being 85% as they were initially, um, that is now down to 50% protection against infection, not severe illness, against infection at greater than six months. Uh, then a booster vaccine a boost of vaccinated individual susceptibility to infection would decrease to 5% relative to the unvaccinated because that is decreased by, say, tenfold. So that would mean that someone who's had a booster dose, 5% uh, five percent relative to the unvaccinated individual compared to the unvaccinated because, of course, these original figures were comparing doubly vaccinated uh, with triply vaccinated, with booster vaccinated people. Um, therefore, vaccine efficacy for booster vaccinated individual, 95%. Pretty good. Similar to what it used to be in the good old days before the Delta variant and the original variant and the Alpha variant. 95% protection against uh, infection. How that reduces viral load, how that reduces uh, the probability that they'll go and infect other people, we don't know. That data is not there yet. We simply don't know yet. This is what we do know. Um, now, conclusion from these authors, our findings clearly, our findings give clear indications of the effectiveness of a booster dose, even against the current dominant Delta variant. So looking, promising, direct quote from these authors. Now, at the moment, um, Pfizer have clearly advocated for a booster dose. Well, to tell you the truth, that's not too surprising. They will sell an awful lot more vaccines. Um, so fair enough, they're entitled to that opinion. Um, that's fine. Um, politicians on both sides of the pond seem to be in favour. President Biden seems to be in favour. Uh, Sajid Javid, we looked at yesterday, certainly seems to be in favour and the preparations are being made. But again, if we go back to the actual data, CDC and... Um, Committee on Vaccination and Immunity in the UK, check out the references for yourself, um, only advising a booster dose at the moment in the US and the UK for moderate to severely immunocompromised people. So this is not policy yet in the um, UK or the US. So that is the data from the, that is the statement. That's, that's the last statement, official statement from the CDC there came out on the 20th of August. And uh, that's the link for the JVCI. Now, this is interesting because um, we notice that the membership, one of the leaders of this group, Professor Andrew Pollard, University of Oxford, uh, Sir, Sir Professor Andrew Pollard, very renowned scientist, um, whom we're grateful to for developing the, the vaccines, of course, um, or, or the Oxford vaccine, who, in which he led the research team. But he was now, I don't, I don't want to put words in the professor's mouth, but I got the impression that he wasn't that keen when we looked yesterday at the, uh, the booster dosing program. Maybe, maybe he's thinking about people getting more natural boost, boost from uh, vaccines. Don't want to put words in his mouth, but that was the impression 
I got yesterday. So will the uh, JVCI be recommending a booster dose? Um, well, maybe not. Um, but of course, lots of other colleagues there to uh, talk to about it and they'll come to a, a collective decision from the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. So uh, there we are. That's that at the moment. So the idea is at the moment, the belief in the UK seems strongly to be that everyone's going to get this infection. Um, if people that are not vaccinated, now I have some friends in high risk categories, or not friends, but people I know in high risk categories, and um, who, who are not yet vaccinated. Now they will be exposed to the virus. I've told them this, and the older ones I've given them a rough, uh, especially the older ones, I've given a rough proportion of their probability of dying. So basically that's that's all I can do. Um, many people in the States who are not vaccinated, if the United States follows the same trajectory as the UK, then I think that everyone in the United States is going to be exposed to this virus. And if they're in a risk, risk group and they're not vaccinated, their risk of severe illness and death is going to be significant. And given the vaccine hesitancy in the States, I'm afraid that makes me pessimistic about ongoing hospitalizations and deaths in the States, less so in the UK because the vaccine uptake is higher. Now, personally, as I started this, if I'm going to be re if I'm going to be exposed to this virus, and I am, um, would I prefer to have a booster dose before I'm exposed? The answer, yeah, I, I would. I would personally, I would prefer to have a booster dose before I was exposed. Having said that, I'm not particularly worried about being exposed because I've had two doses of vaccine already. Now, the Israeli data um, that in the, in the paper they intimated that the safety data is favourable. But this research project said nothing about uh, safety data. It just uh, it kind of put that onto the responsibility of the Israeli Department of Health, who, of course, are monitoring that very carefully. So that was not commented on. So we can only say what this research says. And of course, the World Health Organization and other people have said we shouldn't be giving booster doses until everyone in the world's had at least one dose. But I'm afraid that's probably not going to work if people weren't given booster doses in, in, in richer Western countries. It's not as if we'd all of a sudden start exporting billions of vaccines, as indeed we should, and I hope we do, to poorer parts of the world, but that's not going to be a an automatic uh, sort of follow-on from that. So that's where we're at with booster doses. Personally, through pure personal greed, I, I would, I would uh, have one if I was offered one. But as I say, I'm not particularly worried. But there again, it's only few months since I've finished my vaccine course. I had a longer gap between the two. So I'm relatively comfortable about it. But um, that's the debate on booster doses at the moment. Time will tell. Thank you for watching.